some big issues uh, with this audience. I'm mindful there's a huge range of expertise uh, kind of online, and it would be really great to draw on that over the next hour, one hour and a half. So I will try and limit my remarks um, to uh, as few as possible uh, while endeavoring to set the scene. Um, I'm going to be covering material that many of you will be familiar with. Uh, so please bear with me. I will go through the slides um, of which there's quite a lot rather fast, uh, but Jack can make them available to you um, and you can look at them uh, at your leisure um, over the coming days and weeks, if you wish. Uh, so what I plan to do, if, if um, the system will work for me, yeah, is to say a few words about four topics. Why governing well is, uh, is important, why it's difficult, uh, how well are we doing, and how might we improve what we're doing. And this is all in the context of thinking about the concept of anticipatory governance uh, how do we uh, govern well for the long run, uh, not least by anticipating the kinds of problems we're going to face and, and design our systems, structures, institutions, and so on in ways uh, that will help us uh, cope with, with what is coming at us uh, from the future. Um, so let me start with the topic of why governing for the future matters. And I'm going to be quite brief about this because I think everyone listening in will be well aware why it matters. Uh, there's a vast literature on these sorts of topics um, and many of you will be familiar with that, that literature and you can dabble into it, um, uh, some of the references I've got there. Can I just draw your attention to a book that was published last year by Dr. Jane Davidson, who I got to know in um, the United Kingdom about uh, two years ago. Jane was the Minister for uh, well, the Environment in, in the Welsh um, government uh, during the earlier part of the century uh, and is largely responsible for the legislation that was enacted by the Welsh Parliament in 2015 called the, um, oh gosh, uh, uh, well, it's a legislation about protecting future generations. <laughs> yeah, it's um, the Future Generations, Generations Act. Act, correct. Yeah. Wales Act, that's right. And um, uh, Jane has written a book uh, called Future Gen, Lessons from a Small Country, uh, which basically outlines the, uh, the, the background to that legislation, what it says, and, and an initial uh, reflection on how well it's working. Uh, and this, there's a lot of material online uh, in relation to uh, this legislation, in, in, including obviously uh, from the Office of the Commissioner for Future Generations in, in Cardiff, which you can look at. But I'm not gonna be speaking specifically about Wales, but it is a really interesting uh, piece of legislation that I think has some, some important lessons uh, for New Zealand and elsewhere. A couple of quotes uh, that some of you will be familiar with. A society grows great when old men and women plant trees whose shade they no, they shall never sit in. Um, people looking forward and not just uh, seeking to protect their own interests, but to do things that will benefit future generations. And then from the great law uh, of the Iroquois Confederacy, um, uh, in our every deliberation, we must consider the impact of our decisions on the next seven generations. We obviously face some serious problems. There are various ways of framing the kind of problems we have, um, particularly in the policy sense. And I've listed some of the different ways in which we can frame the challenges we face at the moment. Um, but they include the whole question of, you know, how best to protect future interests and the long-term common good, how to ensure uh, sustainability, why stewardship, uh, how to ensure that we can sort of bring the long run into short-term uh, political focus. I was talking to the governance and um, Administration Committee of Parliament this morning with a colleague about that whole question. How do we get Parliament and how do we get the government to give more attention to the long run? Um, how do we incentivize democratic policymakers to give adequate weight to, to long run risks and vulnerabilities and particularly to creeping problems or slow burner problems? And I'll mention those 
uh, in a moment. Uh, and then the last one there, how do we enhance the quality of anticipated governance? Um, why is governing for the long run really important? Well, very simply, because if we don't govern well, we're going to govern badly. And unfortunately, human beings have the capacity now as a result of enormous technological advances over the last couple of centuries um, to do enormous damage, if not, in fact, uh, destroy um, much of the life on this planet and in, in to make uh, our current civilization uh, terminal. Um, and unfortunately, we, we seem to be proceeding to do that. We are uh, creating uh, ecological havoc and, and the the damage uh, that will be reaped on future generations will be very great. So, so you know, it seems to me there's a very powerful moral duty to um, seek to protect future generations and indeed our future selves and, and to exercise what various people refer to either as good stewardship or trusteeship or guardianship, uh, not only on behalf of human beings, but of, obviously on behalf of the whole biosphere. Um, let me see if I can get this to go. Yes, obviously, as everyone knows online, we face a formidable range of very difficult uh, governance challenges. Um, we're in the midst still globally of a pandemic and there will be more pandemics over the coming decades, almost certainly, uh, but we obviously face huge ecological challenges, uh, ongoing natural disasters of various kinds, we face large scale involuntary migration, which is only going to get worse as climate change uh, impacts more severely across the world. Uh, we, we face the problem of uh, critical infrastructure being vulnerable, uh, indeed vulnerable to cyber attacks as we've just, we're just witnessing right now in the United States. Um, we have significant challenges in many parts of the world with high and, and rising levels of public debt, even though, of course, at the moment we have low interest rates, that won't necessarily remain the case. Um, we have the ebbing of the, of the population uh, of the human tide in the sense that population growth rates are slowing down in most countries around the world, which is a good thing. On the other hand, we're faced with significant population aging, which also poses um, you know, some significant challenges uh, and so on and so on. So lots of big challenges. Um, how should we uh, sort of face those challenges from the point of view of principles for good governance? Huge literature in that space. I'm going to just pass over much of this in just a few seconds, uh, just to draw your attention uh, to uh, the World Commission on Environment and Development, which I'm sure um, most of you are familiar with, and, and, the, and the very important principle uh, that that commission enunciated, namely that the needs, uh, that we should seek to ensure that we meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations uh, to meet their own needs. And whether we focus in on needs or rights uh, or um, possibly well-being, uh, the fundamental point is that we need to ensure uh, a safe prospect uh, for all future generations, uh, you know, for thousands, if not millions of years to come. And we're not doing that very well. Edith Brown Wise, who some of you may uh, be familiar with, uh, a very distinguished um, American legal scholar who I had the pleasure of meeting in Washington DC about seven years ago. She wrote a book back in about 1989, um, which has had a significant impact. And she argued um, uh, that we should seek, that each generation of humanity should leave the planet, quote, in no worse condition than it received it and provide equi equitable access to its resources and benefits. Well, I, I don't think that's enough. <laughs> Uh, not, particularly for generations like us who have done very considerable damage, uh, I think we should be seeking uh, improvement, uh, repair, restoration, and so on. Though I appreciate that's uh, very challenging. Now, just a few words on the concept of anticipatory governance. Uh, it's a relatively new concept in the overall scheme of things. Um, after all, people have been writing about governance uh, for thousands of years uh, in the Western tradition, certainly since Plato and Aristotle. Um, uh, but they didn't talk about anticipatory governance. The, the, the concept of anticipatory governance, to my knowledge, was first used actually in the Canadian master's thesis. So there you are, Jack, uh, a, a Canadian, uh, back in 1993, 30 years ago. Uh, but he, the student was referring to anticipatory 
and, and yes, anticipatory governance. And um, uh, really since then, and, and since the work of a number of people working particularly in the areas of, of sustainability, climate change and so on, the concept has become more widely used. But as it stands currently, as far as I'm aware, um, I think we've got some background noise here. And everyone, please ensure that they have their have their mic on mute. On mute. Yeah. Can everyone please put their mic on mute, except Jonathan, of course. <laughs> Okay, are we are we all right now? Okay, but key point: there's no uh, widely agreed definition and, and no widely agreed uh, set of attributes for anticipatory governance. Um, but there are definitions, and there's a couple here we can come back to to discuss um, if you're interested. But I thought I'd just put up a, a list of attributes that I think are central to this notion of anticipatory governance. And uh, just quickly going through them. So first of all, there's an emphasis on foresight and, and related techniques. So um, th that includes uh, uh, a range of um, approaches, um, <clears throat> uh, which I'm sure many of you will be uh, familiar with, horizon scanning, for example, um, trend analysis and so forth. Uh, it includes uh, a clear commitment to the, to the precautionary approach. I, I realize, of course, that approach can be applied in different ways, but it seemed to me uh, we need a pretty strict kind of precautionary approach. A proactive approach to policy interventions. So rather than waiting for problems to happen and then reacting, actually seeking to be proactive and take uh, action in advance of the problems. And that's going to be particularly relevant for addressing sea level rise, um, rather than waiting for flooding to happen, we need to be moving people out of harm's way in advance. And that's going to be a big challenge for humanity over the coming decades and beyond. Um, a systems approach, a holistic view, rather than a, a narrow sort of sectoral view or, or um, uh, disaggregated view. We, we, we need to recognize the interdependencies between a whole raft of different um, uh, policy sectors and um, uh, uh, you know different things that are going to influence uh, policy outcomes. Uh, we need ad adaptive management, so we need to be agile and willing to change uh, in response to changing circumstances. We need to give particular weight to the goals of resilience and, and sustainability. Um, we need to support participate participatory modes of decision making. Um, not least because if we can't take people with us, uh, then we're not going to be able to do what needs to be done. And it seems to me participation, deliberation and so on provide um, uh, the means of, of taking people with you. And then we need uh, to seek to embed long term interests in in day to day decision making, a, a strategy of embeddedness. Um, and we can talk more about that in due course. Why is it difficult to govern for the future? Uh, well, um, here's a quote from Lord Martin Rees, former um, president of the uh, Royal Society in the United Kingdom. He said, we know we are stewards of a precious pale blue dot in a vast cosmos with a future measured in billions of years. But despite these vastly expanded conceptual horizons, politics and economics are short term and parochial. And it seems to me uh, he's put his finger on a critical challenge. You know, that there's earth rise from the moon. Um, we are just a pale blue dot in a vast cosmos, um, which spreads unbelievably <laughs> across our uh, night sky. Um, uh, and if we don't, if we don't protect this fragile pale blue dot, then well, um, we're done for. Why is it so difficult to, to um, protect kind of future interests? Um, well, here's some quotes from a range of politicians, business people and academics, um, uh, all really saying something about the, the short termism of, of politics. Uh, this is particularly democratic politics, but arguably also autocratic politics. 
And I think Al Gore's uh, statement there, the future whispers while the present shouts is, is very evocative. Um, I think it highlights uh, uh, a good deal of, of, of the kind of the challenge we face. Here's a rather, a rather longer list <laughs> of all the problems that make it difficult for us to govern well for the future. The human condition, the fact that we're dealing with uncertainty, both general and behavioral, a variety of collective action problems that we face, um, in particular, you know, the challenge of protecting local and global public goods, the big global public goods, obviously, including the atmosphere and the oceans and so on, uh, geopolitical tensions and national self-interest, obviously uh, a critical problem uh, in dealing with many, many um, aspects of the uh, ecological challenge facing humanity at the moment. Poor institutional design, both local and global. At the global level, of course, we have weak international institutions that are very much dependent on nation states being willing to um, act collectively, and often they're not. There's a whole variety of political asymmetries um, that make it very difficult um, for governments to make uh, uh, wise decisions for the long run. For example, future generations don't have a vote, current generations do. If, if current generations don't vote to protect future generations, obviously future generations can't protect their own interests. So that's a very powerful political asymmetry. Another obvious one is that you have very powerful vested interests that have enormous resources to protect their, their investments, the fossil fuel industry, for example, here in New Zealand, obviously the dairy industry, and they're ranged against typically much weaker dispersed interests that have a much greater difficulty mobilizing uh, resources to uh, protect diverse interests and future interests. Um, some of our analytical and conceptual frameworks uh, have, have, have not helped us. Um, so for example, as most of you will be aware, the enormous influence and emphasis on GDP uh, as a measure of kind of human progress over the last half century or so uh, has been very unfortunate because it's a flow measure rather than a stock measure. And you can be, you can be expanding your GDP while you're doing enormous social and ecological damage. Uh, eventually, of course, GDP will be, um, will be brought into line by the damage you're doing. But, but in the meantime, uh, you might think you're doing quite well. And, and then there's a whole variety of ethical challenges we face. I mean, competing sort of moral philosophies, uh, but also the problems of uh, incommensurability. H how do we compare um, different systems of value uh, and, and make decisions uh, when these systems of value uh, are in conflict. So a multiplicity of problems that make governing well for the future uh, very difficult. And, and I've given quite a lot of attention over the last seven or eight years to the problem of short-termism, the present is bias, as it's often called, and, and what we might do about it. So I'm not going to um, uh, spend a lot of time on that now. Uh, I just do want to mention creeping problems. Um, because they're a type of policy problem that is actually quite common, but also the kind of problem that's enormously difficult to deal with. So a creeping problem by, by sort of definition is a kind of problem that's out of sight and out of mind. It, it's a problem that grows slowly and gradually uh, over time uh, and, uh, and in, in a way that often people just don't recognize, um, but it's a kind of a cumulative problem. And, and then you reach some sort of tipping point, uh, but by then, uh, unfortunately, an awful lot of damage has been done. Um, so these, you know, cre creeping problems are ones that typically have initially low public visibility, uh, sort of imperceptible change, limited media interest. You may have a group of scientists who know about the problem and know how serious it is, but they have great difficulty getting public, the public to take it seriously and politicians to take it seriously until you reach some sort of tipping point. And of course, an awful lot of ecological problems um, be it deterioration, deterioration of, of fresh water, uh, rising concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, um, uh, deterioration in soil quality, or, or the loss of soil, good soils and so on. All these are kind of creeping problems. And unfortunately, creeping problems tend to be a kind of problem that governments uh, don't deal with very well. So part of the challenge in terms of how do we improve anticipatory governance is how do we make sure that creeping problems or slow threats uh, are given the attention uh, they need. And I've got a, a list of creeping problems here. Many of them are ecological in nature, but there are many, many other problems uh, that we face 
of a creeping nature that are not ecological in nature, increasing inequality of wealth and income, for example, uh, the increasing surveillance society in which we live in, um, and so on. All right. Um, obviously, sea level rise is a big creeping problem. I've got a few slides here that highlight that. Loss of glaciers, again, related to climate change, another kind of creeping problem. Okay, so I've dealt with the question, why should we be concerned about the future? And then why is protecting the future difficult? Quick comment on how well are we doing? Short answer, not very well. Um, a quote here from Bill English, uh, when he was, um, I think, Deputy Prime Minister, rather than Prime Minister. Uh, but he said a hallmark of this government has been to think long term. And you know, when he made that comment four years ago, I have to say, I thought, my goodness, Bill, what's your concept of the long run? <laughs> I thought, if, if you think your government's thinking long term, then you obviously have a very short term view of the long run. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, I mean, he, he, he did think his government was uh, force, exercising a degree of foresight, um, and I'm not so sure. I'm not going to go through all this um, material now, save to say, if we think about a, a range of criteria for assessing how well we are governing for the future uh, in New Zealand and globally, we would have to say, you know, we are not doing very well. Uh, and, and, and obviously at the heart of not doing well, very well, uh, is, is the uh, rundown of uh, um, uh, ecological endowments of various kinds uh, and the huge ecological creeping problems that, that we face, but many other problems uh, as well. We've not been doing very well in terms of our uh, social outcomes, uh, relatively high poverty, poverty rates, uh, um, very significant inequality in terms of, of ethnic um, uh, outcomes and so on and so on. Um, some of you are no doubt familiar with the Manitou, Manitou River. I thought I'd put that one in because it uh, it highlights uh, Nick Smith having a swim in that wonderful river. I think you'd have to pay me a lot of money to swim in that river. Um, some years ago, uh, my wife and I walked the Tongariro crossing and we did it uh, just uh, as, well, <laughs> As ordinary people, we found that we were among thousands and thousands of people doing it the same day. Uh, and um, uh, it just highlighted to me yet again a, a kind of a creeping problem, enormous increase in numbers of tourists uh, all arriving to sort of see some beautiful countryside or do some specific activities at the same time. Uh, obviously, COVID has, has somewhat affected um, the um, demands on some of our uh, top tourist spots in the country, uh, but if if COVID is, is 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 addressed at least partly over the next few years, we do run the risk, of course, of of, of a return to uh, the kind of uh, scenes we've witnessed in New Zealand uh, in in some of our tourist hotspots, and we really must address that challenge head on. Okay. Finally, let me just say a few words then about uh, anticipatory governance and how we might enhance anticipatory governance, particularly here in New Zealand. I've also got some slides on the international arena, but I'm gonna focus primarily on, on New Zealand. And to start with, I think it's helpful just to think about kind of the um, uh, uh, intervention logics or the sort of theories of change that we can bring to bear as we think about how we might better uh, enhanced long-term governance or, or anticipatory governance. And uh, some six, seven years ago, uh, I did an investigation which led on to a book called Governing for the Future, in which I, I um, tried to analyze uh, all kinds of suggestions that people have put forward uh, over the years to enhance uh, long-term governance. And, and, and this includes suggestions from constitutional lawyers, from political scientists, from ecologists, from sociologists, anthropologists, uh, uh, people in the natural and, and, and physical sciences and so on. And I, I outlined a whole list of these uh, suggestions. And then I stood back and said, okay, what is it that, uh, uh, what are the theories of change or the intervention logics underpinning these suggestions? Why do people think that if, 
you do X, like extend the term of parliament or establish uh, um, uh, a foresight a commission or something. Why do people think this will actually make a difference? What are the intervention logics? And I've identified six uh, intervention logics that seem to me to probably capture most of the key, uh, if you like, theories of change. The, the first um, is that um, uh, what's being proposed is, is going to change the motives of decision makers in some way. And in changing the motives, you're going to get different outcomes. People are going to want to do things differently. So they're going to be more, if you like, ecologically focused or whatever. A second is that what you're proposing to do is, is, is going to enhance the capacity for decision makers, be they at central government or local government uh, levels, uh, to make far-sighted decisions. So you're increasing their, their knowledge base, maybe you're increasing the amount of evidence that they have available to them, you're increasing the, uh, their understanding of the future risks that the society faces and so on. So you're, you're basically enhancing uh, their, their capacity for making far-sighted decisions. The third is uh, what you're doing is you're changing the formal constraints within which decisions are made by, for example, introducing certain types of commitment devices. And commitment devices can be both procedural and substantive. The Climate Change Commission here in New Zealand is a classic example of a, of a commitment device. In fact, it, it, it contains a, a series of commitment devices, really. Um, it, it, it involves um, having a, an independent authoritative institution that it's very difficult for governments to ignore. Um, they can but there will be political costs in doing so. So that's a kind of constraint. Uh, it's set up in a way that requires um, uh, the institution to produce certain sorts of things. Um, in this case, um, uh, emission budgets uh, and an emission reduction plan and so forth. Um, uh, and then these things have to be responded to by, by, by the governments of the day. Um, there are many, many commitment devices. The uh, legislation in Wales that I mentioned embodies a whole series of, of commitment devices. But the basic gist is to try and constrain decision makers so they're more likely to make uh, decisions that are good for the long run. A fourth approach is to say, rather than constraining decision makers, and this is particularly elected decision makers, what we'll do is we'll insulate decision makers from short-term political pressures and the best way of doing that, of course, is actually to shift decision rights from elected officials to um, independent experts. And we've done that in New Zealand and many other countries in relation to monetary policy. We've, we've essentially shifted the decision rights on monetary policy from a minister of finance to an independent reserve bank. We do it um, constantly with respect to regulatory bodies. We, we establish independent regulatory bodies that are responsible for making uh, a variety of decisions, or at least hopefully making a variety of decisions uh, in the long-term interests of the, of the country. So uh, there's this insulation uh, sort of aspect to it. The, the, the problem there, of course, is you run the risk of un undermining democratic uh, accountability and control. The, the fifth intervention logic focuses not so much on changing the motives of decision makers, um, or the values of decision makers, but changing the political incentives that they face. And, and well, that particularly focuses essentially on changing the, the hearts and minds of voters, uh, since the primary political incentive, certainly in a democracy, is going to be uh, votes and voices uh, from the public um, uh, uh, and so forth. So the, the challenge then is, well, how do you change the hearts and minds of, of, of voters? What are the kinds of levers that you might be able to pull that are going to make a difference there? For example, deliberative um, uh, institutional arrangements may be, may be a possibility. And then finally, uh, and this is a more sort of um, in, in, in instrumentalist kind of approach to things, you might say, well, you've got a problem here because you lack a coordinating capacity. You lack a capacity to coordinate local and central government, for example, or you lack a capacity to coordinate uh, a, a decision making and a catchment or you 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 lack a capacity to coordinate decision making internationally and so the solution then is to establish um, new coordinating mechanisms that overcome that particular problem and enable you to take decisions that otherwise would not be possible so these intervention logics underpin uh, all the sorts of changes that 
people have made. There may be other intervention logics. I'd be interested if you can think of some. Um, what can we do in New Zealand uh, that would perhaps enhance anticipatory governance? Uh, I mean, there's an awful lot. I've just listed some sort of high level things here. One of them is to change uh, the parliamentary term to extend it to four years and probably to make it a fixed term rather than an open-ended term um, so that prime ministers can't call an early election except in exceptional circumstances. Um, second is to embed the future within our democratic institutions and policy process, processes through extending the, the kinds of commitment devices we have. So for example, we I've mentioned the Climate Change Commission. Well, one possibility is to have a parallel body for all other critical environmental issues, water, soil, uh, oceans, biodiversity, and so on, um, to do the same sort of thing that the Climate Change Commission is, is established to do. Um, lots of other commitment devices, we can come back to that in discussion maybe. A third is to enhance the system, the political system's capacity for foresight by, by building uh, foresight capability uh, within the public sector, within the university community, um, within our parliament and so on. In other words, to ensure that people uh, are, are required uh, to, to focus in on some of the big long-term challenges we face and, and to think about what we should do to address them, uh, to apply the techniques of foresight. Uh, and there are many such techniques uh, to thinking about um, how we might better design our institutions or our policy frameworks and so forth. Fourth uh, approach is to strengthen the institutional voices for the future. Well, we have some of those already. We have a parliamentary commissioner for the environment. We have a children's commissioner who in a sense is a voice for the future as children are our future. But maybe there are a whole raft of other institutional voices that we could either strengthen or, or establish. Maybe we should think uh, about how do we enhance the voice of science in our policymaking community um, uh, within the executive, but also within our parliament. For example, our parliament has hardly any people with significant scientific expertise, um, whether elected or unelected, among the officials, the advisors, very few uh, highly trained scientists. Um, some parliaments around the world, such as the United Kingdom parliament, have a whole uh, sort of unit dedicated to providing high level scientific and technical advice to, to MPs. We, we have nothing like that. Uh, yes, we have a parliamentary library, but certainly when I was doing some research on this a couple of years ago, I think only one, one of the staff members in their research unit uh, had, a, had a high level science degree um, or advanced science degree. Uh, fifth is we can embed the future more firmly within our policy frameworks and our policy tools, a variety of ways of doing that uh, amongst other things. And I was talking to Jack about this before this session. Um, we need to think about how we better integrate uh, environmental or ecological concerns into our budgetary processes, both on the expenditure side and on the revenue side. How do we green, in other words, our budgetary um, institutions and make them uh, more fit for purpose uh, in terms of protecting long-term interests? And finally, how do we nurture uh, a, a political culture that facilitates durable political bargains on, on, on important intergenerational issues? and and that is alert to creeping problems. And can I say just a few quick comments then, and then maybe just throw it open for discussion because I've spoken probably long enough. Um, my reading of the current situation internationally is the current situation internationally is that the countries which seem to be um, exercising uh, the best, if you like, long-term governance are also those societies which are more egalitarian in their income distribution. And the countries which are struggling um, most are the countries which uh, have uh, significant income and wealth inequality. Now, that proposition can be contested, but it seems to me there is a logic to why a more egalitarian society is more likely to be able to um, uh, address big long-term problems. One, of, one reason will be because they're likely to be less politically polarized. Societies which are highly unequal are, are likely to be more polarized uh, than societies which are relatively equal. And, and I think part of the problem in the United States uh, and in other parts of Europe, uh, sorry, in, in, in parts of Europe and, and arguably in other parts of the world, um, which we've witnessed in the last 10, 20 years with, with, with growing political polarization, uh, the rise of, of right-wing populism and so on, is I think uh, directly the result um, 
of increased income and wealth inequality. Not only that, but I think that's been a, a, an, an important dimension. If I'm right, then if we're going to have a political culture that facilitates durable political bargains on some of the really big intergenerational challenges we face, it seems to me we're going to have to try and address income and wealth inequality. And, and that's really hard. And I don't pretend there's any easy solutions to that. It's very easy for a society to increase its wealth and income inequality. You simply cut taxes on rich people. Uh, you do other things that make the tax system less, um, less egalitarian, less progressive, and so on. Reversing that is much, much harder because it's much harder to take uh, away from, from uh, wealthy, um, influential people than it is to, to give things to them. And so I think uh, if, we're, if, if we're going to tackle wealth and income inequality, uh, it's going to be really tough. I note incidentally that the um, OECD has proposed um, that governments should uh, increase uh, their reliance on inheritance taxes um, over the coming years in order to address the fiscal challenges that uh, COVID has generated. Uh, we should note here in New Zealand, of course, we don't have any inheritance taxes. In fact, we we, we have a, a tax regime which is perhaps um, as favorable to, 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 to the wealthy as almost any country on the planet. We don't have estate duties, we don't have inheritance taxes, we don't have capital gain, a comprehensive capital gains tax and so on. But we've also witnessed the challenge of governments actually seeking to make uh, policy changes in this space. So Jack, um, the rest of these slides sort of go through some of the uh, details of how we might enhance commitment devices or develop new commitment devices um, and so on, how we might improve foresight, uh, how we might strengthen voices for the future, and how we might enhance our analytical frameworks and so on. Um, I'm happy to come back to these in, 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 in questions, but then just to sort of sum up, um, you know, we face some very, very big challenges. Uh, we, we need to address them as best we can, because if we don't, the implications for future generations are, are truly horrendous. Uh, unfortunately, there are very powerful uh, reasons why governments find it hard uh, to protect future interests. Uh, but there are things we can do that would make a difference. Um, and uh, we need to, in my view, kind of <laughs> uh, use our imaginations and use our um, uh, energy and <clears throat> intellectual endeavor to, to uh, use all the tools that we can possibly find uh, that, that will enhance our long-term governance or our anticipatory governance. We've made some progress in New Zealand, I think, in, in, in a number of respects in, in recent times, uh, but there's a huge amount more that needs to be done. All right, Jack, I hope that's a, 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 just a useful quick overview and I'm very happy to um, hear what other people have to say and, and respond to, to, to questions uh, where I can. Thank you. That, that's great, Jonathan. Thank you very much. It's a very, very helpful overview. And um, what I, would, I know that some people have already put uh, some questions into the chat at the bottom of your screen. And if anyone has additional questions, if they would please type them in there so everyone can see them and we'll, we'll try to go through them. And as, as you're doing that, there's a couple of questions that occurred to me that I'd like to, to start out with. Um, one, one has to do with the uh, well-being approach that Treasury has implemented a while back. Mm. It seems to me that that has potential to contribute to this process of, of anticipatory governance. And I'd be very interested in your perspective on what its strengths and weaknesses are, and uh, particularly what what can be done to strengthen it at this point, um, in in terms of well, what, what's already right. been accomplished well, and what 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 can be done next to, sure. to move it along. Okay, so Jack, that's a huge question. Let me just make some very quick comments and see what other people might think about this as well. So the first thing is that the Treasury began about twelve years ago to develop what, what it called its living standards framework which has been transmuted now into what is called the well-being framework, partly as a result of the change of government uh, three and a half years ago. The, the living standards framework basically involved uh, a recognition that we needed to focus not only on 
on flows like GDP, but also on stocks. And so the Living Standards Framework had four primary stocks or capitals, natural capital, social capital, human capital, and kind of everything else, manufactured and financial capital. Um, and said, you know, if, if, if we're to govern well, both now and for the future, we need to manage our capital stocks well, uh, and we're not doing particularly well, obviously, in respect of some of those capital stocks, um, most notably our natural capital. Uh, it also had five goals, um, uh, which included um, things like managing risk, uh, sustainability, social cohesion, which became equity, uh, uh, thinking about um, uh, sort of economic growth and productivity. And there's one other, forgive me, I can't remember now. What happened um, around the time of the change of government is, is that the, the language changed from the living standards to well-being. I'll come back to well-being briefly in a minute. But also the Treasury took away the five goals, um, uh, the Pentagon, uh, and kind of left the, its, its um, analytical framework devoid, <laughs> really, of of um, uh, the, 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 well, those, those, those five goals. Now the treasury would probably say, well, we've replaced it with uh, well-being and, and a whole set of well-being domains, um, 12 domains, and then, and then arguably a, a set of you know, targets and, and, and indicators in relation to those domains. Two or three very quick comments here on that well-being framework. First of all, I'm an advocate of having a holistic approach to the goals of governments and uh, to ensure that we um, uh, think about performance in a very broad way, integrated way, rather than having a very uh, narrow um, fixation with one particular or just several uh, indicators like GDP or inflation or whatever. So uh, philosophically, I'm well disposed to the well-being framework. Um, having said that, uh, a focus on well-being is problematic, problematic in a number of respects, Jack. The first is uh, it doesn't tell you whose well-being is most important. It, it doesn't tell you how to balance current and future generations' well-being. Uh, it, it doesn't really tell you what kind of well-being is most important. Is it, is it um, you know, spiritual well-being? economic well-being, cultural well-being, social well-being, um, uh, ecological well-being, or, or whatever. It doesn't tell us either how we balance uh, the needs of nature, if you like, with the needs of humanity and so on. So it, it, leave, it leaves open a whole lot of really um, difficult and critical philosophical stuff. And the final comment I'd make is that while I'm in favor of a well-being approach relative to what we've had, um, uh, I think it's fair to say that the well-being approach fits more within, a, if you like, a utilitarian um, uh, philosophical framework than, say, a rights-based uh, philosophical framework. And I must confess, I'm more inclined to a rights-based philosophical framework. So you know, the big philosophical debates over the last few hundred years have been between those who say, you know, we should maximize utility, now it's maximize well-being, uh, and those who say, actually, uh, there's a whole lot of really critical things which we can call rights that matter, uh, civil rights, political rights, social rights, economic rights, the rights of nature, and so on, uh, and rights trump utility, um, at least often. <laughs> And um, uh, from a philosophical point of view, and this I think reflects, to be honest, my, my theological underpinnings as a Christian, uh, I'm much more inclined to focus on rights than I am on utility. And so if it comes to the crunch, I would rather we had a rights-based approach. Let's go back to the, you know, United, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights rather than a well-being approach. But I'd, I'd settle for a well-being approach ahead of, what we've had any day. <laughs> yeah, well, that's an interesting uh, distinction, the, 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 the rights versus the utilitarian approach. Um, is, is, is there any um, consideration of, of framing the well-being issues in a rights perspective? 
I mean, are, are they really incompatible? They're not necessarily incompatible, Jack, <laughs> uh, because, uh, you know, one of the domains of well-being can be and is indeed, uh, you know, your sort of civil, civil rights, or civil and political rights. So, you know, one of the ways of saying, of, of testing, testing kind of the degree or level or, or amount of well-being uh, that people have is, is uh, you know, how, how um, extensive uh, are their civil and political rights and, and how readily can they uh, enjoy uh, those rights. So it's not necessarily, but, but um, I think rights matter <laughs> whether or not they generate well-being. <laughs> so, uh, um, you know, if, if we think about the right to vote, um, that's absolutely critically important. And it's based on a view that every individual uh, beyond a certain age um, is of equal, of equal value and they, and, they, and, they, and they feel like their, their voice should have equal weight in the political domain. Now, whether or not that enhances well-being, frankly, uh, one level, I couldn't care less. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's not designed to achieve well-being. It's designed to recognize uh, that human beings are of equal value and, and, and should have an equal right to participate in, in, in their society. Yeah, it occurs so, to me so that... It's, that, a, it's that... a different kind of worldview, Jack. Mm -hmm. But it occurs to me that the, the, the comment you made about the well-being approach... Um, the, the, some of the inadequacies, the way the Treasury has currently conceptualized it in terms of, you know, what kind of well-being. Um, and who's, and who's well-being? That's, that's one of the things that, that bothered me about it is that, they, you know, it was a, a very big tent and, and not very well defined at all. There was, there was no real theory of what, you know, what well-being was. Um, and anyway, it's, well, it's well, interesting. No, that, that's, well, Jack, I mean, there's a huge philosophical debate about the nature of well-being. Sure, I mean, there's, sure. there's, books, there's books written about this. The, the OECD, I think, has done a creditable job in trying to identify uh, you know, what, what it calls domains of well-being. Um, and we've basically taken the, the OECD perspective on this and added a, 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 another domain, which is essentially cultural well-being. Uh, and, and, and I think, you know, what the what the OECD has done is is um, is defensible uh, and plausible and credit you know creditable, um, but it it still it doesn't it doesn't tell you what to do. <laughs> it doesn't tell you whether we should focus on the well-being of the poor or the well-being of the rich. It doesn't tell you whether we should focus on the well-being of people today or people in a hundred years' time. Mm -hmm. You know, to address that, we need other. Um, criteria or principles, uh, uh, ethical judgments. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, anyway, thank, look, you, others, for others may have views thank you for introducing that, that, uh, that, that fascinating um, juxtaposition of, of different perspectives. But it's, it's an important one that I hadn't considered. And, and uh, it's, it's always useful to have your mind expand it like that. <laughs> Okay, well, I turn turn uh, uh, to some of the questions in the um, in the chat. Um, one of the questions from Sally is: uh, Would you consider citizens' assembly as as a possible um, you know commitment device? Can can you see that helping to insulate uh, politicians and decision makers by getting broad public consensus through something like a citizens' assembly? Yes. So the first thing I need to say is that <clears throat> I have read some of the literature on um, uh, deliberative democracies, uh, de de deliberative democracy, and um, there's a there's a rich literature there now, um, and there have been you know a variety of experiments uh, around the world using different sorts of deliberative mechanisms, of which citizens citizens assemblies and citizens' juries and so on uh, are um, among the most obvious uh, manifestations. Um, in general terms, I'm very much in favor of deliberative institutions. Um, there is, I think, reasonably robust social science evidence uh, 
that when you bring people together to deliberate about a particular problem, uh, first of all, um, uh, in the main, uh, the people involved uh, engage with that um, issue uh, thoughtfully. Uh, they they uh, typically are able to understand the full range of considerations that need to be brought to bear. Uh, and they are, um, uh, in a deliberative context, particularly if it's, if it's well managed, more likely to, to um, what is, the, 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 there'll be a tendency to uh, shift their position or an openness to shift their position, and, and also to think uh, about uh, what might be, if you like, in the public interest rather than just private interest, and what might be for the long term um, interest of the community and not just the short term interest of the community. So, you know, um, I, I can provide people with some articles on this if, if people are interested in uh, over the coming days, but uh, I think there's, a, there's at least some reasonably robust evidence um, that deliberative mechanisms uh, enhance uh, the, the quality of, of uh, analysis uh, and extend the time horizons of people and extend the, 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 the kind of openness to, to thinking about problems in a different way. Um, so anything we can do that will enhance deliberative approaches to problem solving, I think we should we should try <laughs> and adopt. Having said all that, you know there are obvious limits to the numbers of, if you like, you know, citizens assemblies, citizens juries that we can run at any one time. The number of issues that can be cooked can be put to such bodies. Um, so you know there are there are some practical limits um, in particularly in a large democratic polity, you know, like New Zealand, or let alone much, much bigger ones. So I think that's an issue, Jack, that, you know, we, we have to recognize um, there are there, there, there are um, there are times and seasons for using different sorts of deliberative mechanisms. But in the end, still lots of decisions are going to have to be taken by our representative institutions, our parliaments. And while parliaments are supposed to be deliberative, <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, some of the time they spend in non-deliberative <laughs> shouting matches. So, so one of the questions then is, you know, how how might you reform your parliamentary institutions in ways that enhance the the quality of of long-term decision making? And and well, we can come to that if people are interested. Yeah, are are there any particular deliberative democracy uh, approaches or mechanisms other than citizens assembly that you think are particularly hopeful or worthwhile? So, so Jack, there's a there's a whole lot of what are called sort of mini publics um, that people have proposed, uh, and some of these will be uh, online uh, sort of mini publics. Others will be face to face. Um, uh, they have different structures in terms of the numbers of people who might be involved, um, uh, and the range of sorts of issues and questions that that people are required to address. Uh, I mean, there's, a, there's, a, there's quite a substantive literature on this now, Jack. Um, yeah, no, I'm very I'm aware of that. I was just curious. Some very useful to... summary articles. Um, I'm just trying to remember the name of, um, uh, yes, John Dreisick, an Australian political scientist, political philosopher, uh, is perhaps one of the best known writers in this, in this field. Um, and if people are interested, he, he's um, written both books and a whole series of articles on, on deliberative institutions uh, of different kinds. Um, Graham, Graham Smith in the United Kingdom, uh, uh, likewise. In fact, I think he's recently finished a book on, on deliberative institutions. I have to be honest, Jack, it's not my primary area of research, so I, I need to be careful what I say here. Yeah. Okay, we'll move on to a question from uh, Rosalind about educating politicians about, you know, the long term issues and, you know, similar to the, the sort of things that you've been discussing this evening. I know, I know you've discussed this, this option mm. of uh, uh, educating politicians as, you know, when there's a new term of parliament and so on. Could you speak to that? Is, is that happening anywhere? Is that, uh, do you see that as a useful step? Yes. So, um, 
various things that I think probably relevant to comment on. The first is just for the benefit of those who, who aren't aware, I was asked by the clerk of the house um, David Wilson uh, about three years ago if I would help some of his staff uh, prepare a report for the Standing Orders Committee uh, of the House um, on the question about how we might enhance um, the uh, ways in which Parliament holds governments to account for the quality of their long-term governance. And over the period of mid-2018 to mid-2019, I worked with a team of people in uh, the office of the clerk and a few colleagues in the university to produce quite a substantial report on this whole question about how, how do we get parliament to um, uh, exercise its, its proper role of holding the executive to account, but not just sort of generally, but specifically for the quality of its long-term governance. And so that report is available uh, on the parliamentary website. It's also on the um, website of the Institute for Governance and Policy Studies, which, which published the report. Um, and it had a whole series of proposals um, for parliamentary reform. Um, everything from the question about how we organize the select committee system to how we run select committees, how we resource them, with analytical uh, advice, scientific advice and so forth, through to questions about um, uh, some new commitment devices that um, uh, we could in institute, for example, a requirement for the Prime Minister to, to give um, um, an outline of the government's um, future focused goals uh, at the beginning of every parliament, uh, through to a range of other, other, other mechanisms. We also outlined uh, sort of broader constitutional reforms, including extending the term of parliament, introducing a fixed term parliament and, and, and so forth. So, so there's that side of it. Then in terms of educating MPs, uh, bear in mind, you know, most people who get elected to parliament come with, you know, a reasonable amount of, of education and experience and, and um, expertise of various kinds. Um, but many of them don't know much about um, uh, lawmaking uh, and about how policy gets made within the public sector and so forth. So a couple of years ago, um, uh, Parliament uh, asked the uh, asked Victoria University if, if we could assist in some way in running programs uh, for politicians. And over the last couple of years, we've been running courses for, for MPs um, on policy analysis uh, on constitutional issues of various kinds, on um, economic policy uh, making and so on. And uh, we've also done some short, short courses and that kind of thing. Um, I have to be honest, Jack, I'm not sure just how helpful that material has been, um, but the MPs who've been, um, uh, who've been involved in those programs can speak for themselves and say whether they found it useful. Um, uh, I've certainly enjoyed the engagement that I've had with MPs through that that uh, particular process. Um, how, how many but, actually but, but I'd have to say, uh, I, Can I just add two, two or three other very quick points? The first is that our parliament is very small by international standards, 120 MPs. Most parliaments, even for countries of our size, are significantly bigger. Um, Norway, about 179, I think. Uh, Denmark, 200 MPs. Um, uh, uh, Sweden, which of course is somewhat larger population, has 350 MPs. Ireland um, has a lower house, I think 166, but it also has a Senate of about 60, so over well over 200 uh, politicians. We have a small house, so that that is limiting, uh, limiting in terms of the range of expertise and and backgrounds and so on. And 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 I think we should have a larger. Uh, a larger parliament, but unfortunately, most people think we've got too too many politicians. Um, uh, the second quick comment is, I really do think we need to have better resourcing of parliament by the by by means of 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 uh, independent analysis for MPs, uh, better scientific and technical uh, expertise being being made available uh, to to politicians. Um, we don't, for example, at the moment have uh, 
a chief science advisor to parliament. Um, I think we should. <laughs> Uh, so, so there's a range of things that go simply beyond, if you like, quite educating MPs, but to, to the resources that MPs have available to them to help them do their job. Okay, thanks. And the next question from Sally here is about extending the election cycle uh, and, and what impact that might have. I know, I know you've addressed this in some of your writing. Yes, so I'm an advocate of a four-year parliamentary term, and I have been for a very long time. Uh, if we move to a four-year term, it seems to me we should have a, a fixed or semi-fixed term uh, so that prime ministers can't call snap elections willy-nilly, because if they can, then potentially extending the parliamentary term won't, won't in fact, in, achieve its objective. There are various ways you, you can fix a parliamentary term. It can be an absolute fix so that you have... Uh, uh, an election every four years on a particular date, for example, as in the presidential elections in the United States, uh, as in Norway, or you can have a semi-fixed parliament, uh, parliamentary term, which enables you to call in the election, but only under very certain, cir un under specified circumstances. In Sweden, they've, they've devised a mechanism, which I think is rather, rather good, which is that, yes, you can call an early election, but if you do, you still have to have the election you would otherwise have had. Um, so what that basically means is, uh, yes, if you get to a point where you've got complete stalemate because of the, the way the numbers have fallen in Parliament and, and the and government simply can't govern, you can uh, call an early election to deal with that stalemate, uh, but you then have to take on board the wrath of, of voters uh, in, in going to the polls again, uh, possibly only, you know, Eight months later. So uh, that's a very, very powerful incentive for politicians to try and sort themselves out and, and work together for the common good. And I think something like that might be, might be a sensible solution. It means that you can, if you really do have a constitutional crisis, call an early election, but, but um, boy, you have to have very powerful reasons for doing it because you're going to have to have another election um, not long afterwards. Right. I, I don't have the comment I'd make, Jack, is that while I'm in favour of a longer term, I frankly don't think it's going to make a huge difference to the quality of governance or, or to the quality of anticipatory governance. Um, uh, on the margins, it's going to help uh, governments deal with some very big problems, which, are, which, which, which at the moment they have only limited time to address, so, for example, I'm involved, as I mentioned, in the Ministry for the Environment at the moment, working on resource management reform. It's incredibly complicated. Uh, it would be wonderful to have an extra year uh, in which you can then consult more fully with, with citizens, uh, do, do more detailed analysis, uh, and, and have a bit more time to kind of work, work through the big problems uh, that need to be addressed. A three-year parliamentary term means, you know, essentially everything has to be done quite fast and when things are done fast, there's always a greater chance that you'll make uh, some bad decisions or make a mess of things. So, but having said that, I, you know, we, we have to reckon on the fact that countries like New Zealand and Australia, which have short parliamentary terms, much shorter than the majority of countries uh, which have democratic institutions, nonetheless, uh, broadly speaking, Australia and New Zealand are relatively well governed. Um, and we're not likely to be vastly better governed if we had a four-year term. Yeah. Um, okay. We'll move on to Mark's question about barriers. You know, you, you mentioned a whole range of, of barriers to anticipatory governance, and, and Mark's question is about um, the relationship between those barriers and whether there are some key ones or trigger ones that, if they're removed or or mitigated in some way. Uh, that might facilitate the elimination of, of other barriers? Well, that's a really interesting question. Um, I suppose another way of putting it would be, you know, of the various causes of the problems we have in terms of trying to ensure good long-term governance, you know, which, which are, are the really critical ones? Is it, is it the human condition, our tendency to be myopic, and self-interested and so on? Uh, is it 
political economy problems, the power of vested interests? Um, is it is it um, the the problem that um, uh, we have these powerful political asymmetries operating within a democracy? Um, mm. I wish I knew. <laughs> I mean, I, I tend to be I tend to be of the view, uh, Jack, that most big problems are multi-causal and 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 tend to be relatively wicked in the sense that they they're not amenable to any simple solution and 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 that every solution you come up with probably is going to create some new problems unfortunately um so uh i i so you know if if someone said you know is the fundamental problem here constitutional i'd say no is the fundamental problem institutional i'd say no is the fundamental problem the human condition uh, well no it's really a whole combination of things and and they're all interconnected <laughs> and, and i suspect that their relationship in terms of being triggers or facilitating others varies from from issue to issue as well yes indeed and from country to country and from time to time mm -hmm. you know so there will be times and seasons um and and obviously there are the 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 there are times when you have a crisis that enables you to do things that you can't otherwise do um you know i mean just to think in new zealand uh, in the last uh, 16 months we've witnessed things that probably most of us would never have envisaged i mean if someone had said to me 18 months ago that we would close the borders for well an indefinite period mm. i'd have said you're mad <laughs> and, well we've done that we don't know when the borders are going to open again. Mm -hmm. um, um, but there were, you know, there were good reasons for doing what the government did. But boy, I mean, uh, quite remarkable. It, which also does highlight, Jack, doesn't it? You know that that in in a, in a crisis, if you have a sufficiently emer in a sort of emergency situation, you are able to do things that otherwise really, really um, extremely difficult to do. Years ago, I, 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 look, I'd be interested in what other people think. So I'll, I'll make this comment and then I should shut up. But in 2006, in March 2006, I helped run a conference at Zapapa on climate change. And we had a whole raft of distinguished international speakers, um, scientists, business people, and so on. One of the speakers was Lord Ron Oxbear, who was a distinguished geologist had been the head of Imperial College London and also had been chair of the big company called Shell, <laughs> the big energy company, uh, oil company. And um, he said in the course of his keynote address at um, the Soundings Theatre at the end of March 2006, that he thought climate change was so such a serious issue uh, that we should put the global economy on a war footing to deal with it. This is 15 years ago. He said, we should put the global economy on a war footing to deal with the seriousness of the problem. I mean, I think he's right. <laughs> but, but two things to note. The first was, those remarks were never reported. I was amazed. There were journalists in the audience. Nobody reported this. Um, and the second, of course, nobody's done it. <laughs> um, and even now, you know, 2020, 20, um 2021 uh, you know with with all the knowledge we have of what is what the risks are if we fail to decarbonize the global economy very fast despite that uh you know most democracies are struggling uh to to really implement the kinds of policies needed to make a difference and it's all very well we can say thank goodness you know trump has been replaced by biden and that Biden is now committed to very large emission reductions by 2030. We still have to ask, well, how is he going to achieve it? It's all very well having a target, you know, really be able to get the sort of policy measures needed to achieve that target through, um, through Congress. Um, well, there's a very significant risk he won't. And we've got a Republican party, uh, the majority of whom seem to still doubt that we've got a problem. I mean, you know, it's incredible. 
Let's, anyway, let's I'd be interested to, to know what others have to say, Jack. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's there's still a lot of questions here. Unless unless anyone has a burning comment they would like to make, uh, perhaps you could um, uh, use the uh, the reaction uh, and and use the the clap signal to indicate you would like to make a comment. Give you an opportunity to do that, or I'll, I'll continue going through the questions. Now we've got more questions coming. Um, well, uh, we can keep going, Jack. Um, yeah, I, I'm just going back to the. Um, to the questions there was, that's right, one from Deirdre about uh, systems approaches being important and suggesting that the Climate Commission should be supplemented by other environmental ones. Mm. Yet a system inter requires integration of the, you know, a futures commission to sort of put it all together because these things are, are ultimately related. Mm. Um, so, so, Jack, I think one of the big problems we've got in terms of dealing with our ecological problems in New Zealand is that uh, clearly the sorts of policy changes that are needed, whether it's with respect to water or biodiversity, climate and so on, they, are, they require hard decisions, hard decisions in the sense that politicians will risk losing votes and, and also uh, upsetting very powerful interests uh, that will campaign vigorously against them. And um, so the significant political risks in, in making the sorts of decisions that really ought to be made uh, in the interest of long-term uh, ecological sustainability. And the question then becomes, how do, we, how do we reduce those risks? What are the sorts of things we can do that, that will make it easier for politicians um, to, to make the decisions that they ought to make in the long-term uh, uh, public interest uh, in the interest of long-term sustainability. Um, I don't think there's any simple answer to the question, but it's one that deserves, you know, a lot of careful thought. Um, one, one, one way is having things like the Climate Commission yeah. uh, that provide expert authoritative advice that is very hard to reject. We haven't had that kind of institution before in the environmental space with the possible exception of the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment. But the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment uh, you know, is a relatively small institution and it's one person <laughs> rather than a commission. Um, and uh, it, it hasn't kind of had the mandate that the Climate Change Commission has in specific statutory terms. Yeah, but the point of my question was yes, that, yeah. that, that um, uh, solving the climate issue is one thing, but there are a lot of other environmental problems to solve. And, you know, Molly asked a question, for instance, of one of the commissioners on one of the webinars, um, where she said, and what do you predict the energy use will be? Will that just keep going up until 2050? And he said, yes. And, and GDP, and he said, yes, or it'll be 72% instead of 73%. You know, this is really critical. I mean, because we're only dealing with one issue and they're all interrelated, the material yes. throughput and the energy use of a, of a, and the complexity of a society is really just as important. Yes, so, so I, Totally understand your concern here, Deirdre. Uh, there's multiple concerns, uh, but but one of them is that uh, our ecological problems are all interconnected, um, and we can't solve one without uh, endeavouring to solve to solve the others. Um, uh, if we don't if we don't ad address biodiversity uh, problems, um, well, there's going to be a whole set of other issues and and um, what have you. Anyway. Uh, the, the, the question from an institutional design point of view is, should we seek to have some overarching cross-domain cross system-wide 
institution, mm -hmm. or should we have a series of domain specific uh, institutions? In which like case, the you have to integrate Commission. them and you have to get them communicating. Yes. But <laughs> the, <laughs> yes. But, we, but, but can I just, just finish here? So finish. we now have a climate commission. <laughs> I, for one, would be very reluctant to do anything that might damage that commission in the near term because yeah. it's just getting underway. The UK model seems to have worked tolerably well, uh, relative at least to what might have been the case if we hadn't had a climate change committee in the UK. And um, uh, I, I, I'd be very reluctant to kind of mm -hmm. uh, change the commission, the climate change commission in, 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 in the near term. So if that's the case, you then have to say, okay, uh, what do we do for the other domains? Uh, well, we could have domain specific institutions, one for you know, biodiversity, one for water, one for coast, one for oceans, whatever. I don't think that would be very sensible, Deirdre. So no. my, my view is it would be preferable, preferable to have uh, some overarching body that, that speaks for the whole um, yep. Yep. Um, uh, sort of environmental domain, a whole mm -hmm. lot, uh, with the exception of arguably of, 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 some, of some specific aspects of climate that are clearly covered by the Climate Change Commission. And then to try and ensure that the Commission, the Climate Change Commission and this other body um, obviously have a proper <laughs> dialogue together about the matters that are uh, interdependent. Um, but uh, in, in all this, we, 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 we face you know, some really challenging political issues. There's first of all, the question would, would um, uh, our current parliament support some new co commission, independent commission that covers everything other than climate? Um, secondly, uh, there's considerable, um, uh, you know, demand within the Māori community for having a, a Tamana or Tatayo commission uh, that would be predominantly a Māori body or a body representing Māori interests, rights and interests. And then you have to say, well, where would that fit? Would, would you tack it on uh, to uh, some sort of um, uh, broad environmental council? Uh, or would it stand separately? And, and what would its powers and functions be? So that's another issue. And then even if you did establish a body comparable to the Climate Commission kind of for everything else, if I can put it that way, plainly it would have to have sub, sub panels for specific issues because you know, freshwater issues are, are distinct and require specific expertise relative to soil, relative to biodiversity and so on. And then there's the problem, well, what might the implications of that be for, you know, for uh, the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment? Another institution which I, for one, would be reluctant to, to damage. Mm. So, so, you know, the, there's no simple institutional <laughs> fix here, it seems to me. Yeah, you know, we lost our Futures Commission and, it, and their stuff isn't even online. Yes, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure, Deirdre, that simply a Futures Commission would would help very much. I'm not against a futures commission, mm -hmm. and I I like very much the uh, the Welsh model of having a commissioner who speaks for future generations. But bear in mind, they don't have a parliamentary commissioner for the environment, mm -hmm. and in some ways, you know, the parliamentary mm -hmm. commissioner for the environment is is the strongest, if you like, voice for the future okay. uh, that we have. Mm -hmm. And not surprisingly, uh, much of the focus of the Welsh Commissioner for Future Generations is about environmental issues, not least climate change and biodiversity. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, Jonathan, one of the things that, that strikes me is, you know, the, the, the broad range of policy changes that are needed to really boost the whole anticipatory governance approach. Uh, you know, you, it's, it's a very complex process and there's many components that are either weak or totally missing. And, mm -hmm. and it's obviously going to be a, a long-term process. But it, also in passing, you mentioned powerful vested interests. Mm -hmm. To what extent is that a relevant barrier in terms of interfering with the sort of uh, policy suites that seem obvious to, to implement? Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, we don't have 
long enough parliamentary terms. We don't have a, enough parliamentarians to, to, to serve on parliamentary committees for the, for the future or whatever. But how, how much are, are, are vested interests interfering with some of these uh, progressive policies? In your, in in your time. View? I think Molly wants to have a comment on that. No, no, I just said it matters big time. Yes, absolutely, well, I, Molly. I, well, I, I, you may have been watching events in Australia, where two former what? prime, where where two former prime ministers, um, uh, joined forces in highlighting the enormously damaging role of the Murdoch press in Australia, and its huge impact on Australian. Um, on the quality of Australian democracy. Yes. And much the same could be said about the impact of the Murdoch press uh, in the United Kingdom and in the United States. Here you have, you know, a mega rich uh, individual or family um, that has deliberately chosen to uh, seek to exercise an enormous influence on democratic politics in a series of Western democracies um, and has been relatively successful. Um, and I think has done huge damage to the integrity of democracy, unfortunately. Yeah, what, what's, um, your, what's your and, experience and in terms of the New Zealand uh, situation? Well, thank, thankfully, Murdoch hasn't been so sort of influential on this side of the Tasman. And we haven't had a no, Fox but, News. But, but uh, surely there are, there are powerful political or powerful vested interests. That oh, yes, absolutely. So I to was, what extent was, are they interfering with the New Zealand? Well, uh, pro I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty obvious, Jack, that um, you know, on, on some of the issues that we've been talking about this evening, if it's climate, there's no question that the fossil fuel industry in New Zealand and the dairy industry in New Zealand has exercised enormous influence over the policy direction of governments uh, for the last 30 years or so. No, no question at all. And they're continuing to try to do so, obviously. You know, there's been a very strong, strident campaign against the Climate Change Commission from powerful vested interests. Wow. And we'll have to see what an impact that has. Um, um, and, and then, you know, in other policy domains, you, you, you think about, um, uh, you know, uh, seeds and biodiversity, you know, Monsanto and is it Bayer and, and, and other big multinational corporations obviously exercise huge influence in, in those sorts of policy domains. Um, yeah, so there's absolutely no question that, that you know, the business interests of various kinds, and not just business interests, but typically business interests, uh, exercise um, a, a disproportionate influence on many important issues of public policy. Uh, and part of the challenge in climate change, obviously, has been to try and shift the fulcrum of the business community uh, in, 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 in a way that um, enough influential business people see it as in their interests commercially to act to address climate change. And, and we do seem finally to be getting close to that tipping point if we haven't already crossed the tipping point um, where, where enough business interests, be they banking, um, insurance, um, renewable energy, clean energy, whatever, companies now see themselves as, um, well, as having a, a powerful interest in decarbonization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Can I add? Go ahead, Molly. They are, the business in, <clears throat> interests in this country have been able to narrow the scope of the Climate Change Commission's work so that it cannot achieve what we really want. That is, the uh, CCC believes that we need to grow by 72% rather than 73%. Now, essentially, they want the original growth path. And I believe that it is vested interests are driving this, narrowing the scope of what the CCC can consider. Um, we're approaching approaching closing time, and I have to apologize to the folks who have put questions up that uh, we've not been able to get to. Uh, but I'd like to put one last question to you, Jonathan. And 
we have a, a federal or a, a national budget coming up. Um, what are the few things that you would like to see in it that you feel would make the, the most contribution to anticipatory governance? Oh, well, um, Jack, you and I were talking about this earlier. Uh, I, I think we need to move to uh, a very specific kind of green budgetary approach uh, in which, amongst other things, the government is very transparent in its budget about what it is doing uh, that will impact on the environment, either positively or negatively. So you actually have a positive list and a negative list, if you like. France has done this, incidentally, in its recent budgets. Um, uh, it's, it's identified what areas of spending uh, will likely improve the environment, what areas of spending will actually, actually uh, impact negatively on environmental outcomes, and what areas of spending probably will, will, be, will be relatively neutral. Uh, and one can do the same for revenue. You know, what areas of revenue that we're collecting uh, are likely to help uh, improve environmental outcomes, maybe because they're environmental taxes, what areas might actually um, impact negatively on environmental outcomes um, for one reason or another, uh, and, and what areas of revenue might, might be relatively neutral. Uh, so greater transparency and specificity uh, in the budget process uh, in terms of environmental outcomes would be, would be at least one um, step in the right direction among many uh, other possible steps. And if I could just make one final comment, Jack, and then I, I need to get to bed. <laughs> but, um, well, thank you for those who've listened in. And I'm sorry, perhaps we haven't had more of a dialogue, uh, more, more deliberation. Um, I've, I've done most of the talking, uh, and I'm sorry. But um, it, it would be really good to have a further discussion sometime uh, about the whole issue of economic growth. And um, how we need to, well, how we can understand uh, the nature of economic growth, because this is a huge topic and it's an important one. But if I can make a very simple distinction, we do need to distinguish between growth in the size of things <laughs> like buildings or roads um, uh, or you know stocks of capital, whatever, and growth in the value. Uh, of the goods and services uh, we exchange. Um, and potentially, if, if we were being absolutely faithful in protecting um, uh, ecological goals uh, and acting completely consistently with what is needed for long-term ecological sustainability, it, it, it is at least conceivable that we could improve or increase the value of the goods and services exchanged yeah. among us, uh, potentially uh, forever, <laughs> um, uh, on the basis that the only limit, assuming we are doing everything right in terms of in terms of ecological sustainability, the only limit to enhancing uh, the value of the goods and services we exchange in such a world would be uh, our human imagination. Well, Jonathan, I think you've just invited yourself to another webinar. <laughs> we, we would love to have that discussion with you. Um, and uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you very much for this one. It's, it's been very informative and uh, certainly has introduced new ideas and concepts to me, and I hope to to others as well, uh, while it's still left a lot of questions. And, and uh, you've given us, a, um, I think, a very helpful overview of, of uh, some of the challenges that we face and uh, that we could face more realistically in, in terms of trying to, uh, to move this whole thing forward. So uh, again, thank you for all of you who have attended. Uh, and to remind you that uh, Jonathan's slides will be on the OCD website to make them available as well as the YouTube link if you would like to um, you know, come back to the recording or, or tell others about it and, and direct them to it. So we will um, 
Uh, our next webinar will be in a month. I can't recall the date at the moment, but uh, Max Raxbrook, Max Rax, Rashbrook, sorry, Rashbrook. will be t talking to us about uh, taxation and inequality issues. And um, again, the notice will be on the our declaration website. So thanks to all who participated, and especially to Jonathan. Okay. And Thank uh, you. thanks, Jack. Very many good wishes. All right. Good night, everyone. Okay. Good night, all. Thank you. Right. Bye. Thanks, Bye. 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 Bye.